<laughs> we have Mark talking about self-service cloud. All right, I'll uh, make up some time because I know it's getting late and I can't stay for the next talk. Um, it was interesting because the previous talks were all very interesting and it all kind of ties into what I want to talk about. Uh, and one one value add of the Jenkins uh, talk that I talked to him about was you can actually do dynamic lookups. So it looks declarative, but you can actually do dynamic lookups, which is pretty nice because plugins otherwise don't allow you to do a lot of you know variable dynamic variable entry. So that was cool. Um, the next talk was about workflows, so this kind of ties in as well, and of course summons. That would be awesome. We could use that within our workflows. So what I want to talk about is uh, essentially. In a shared environment, the assumptions that, that I'm taking here is that you're in a shared environment, which means you're in one Amazon account. Let's also assume you're in one VPC, and because you're sharing a direct connect, right? So you don't want to like have too many direct connects. And so within that environment, you have you have a lot. Of, your uh, blast radius is pretty large, right? So you've got subnets, uh, route tables, security groups. Of course, instances that other people use, you know, Jenkins instances and NAT, NAT instances. So your blast radius is large. So you're in this environment, and you have to trust the people within, within this environment, right? So they have to follow procedures. This is kind of like what you, you really have to follow a, a workflow and trust the people that are also out there. So. One way to do this, one way to approach this, is to define not not roles but really classifications. So you know you think of an admin role, but you also think of maybe a power user. But outside of that, you've also got uh, limited access and indirect access, and those aren't roles. Those are situations. Those those are things like so admin of course has access to everything. A power user would have access to almost everything. So things like they wouldn't have access to AWS config, they wouldn't have access to IAM. Uh, limited would be tying them to a subnet or tying them to something that's that's only tagged, right? So they can do anything within what's tagged within that context. And indirect is something that's more specific, like yes, you can run a, a command on RDS or something like that, right? So within, within admin, you can do anything. So this is kind of like a visual. And within power, you're kind of taking away some of those services, right? So IAM and well, <laughs> either way, I skipped ahead. <clears throat> either way, with with power or admin, you're really giving them too much control. And when you have that much control in a large environment, we we have a lot of people onboarding. And I know that everybody thinks that IAM is simple, but nobody does it the right way. It can always be better, you know. Like, and IAM really is not simple. Not yes. simple. But people think of it as simple. And nobody does it right, and you know, least privilege is never least privilege. So there was a question actually that came from the audience before my talk about, well, I'm new to I'm new to AWS, and so they're restricting my access for the EC2 instance, but he, he nudged me and he said, once you get into the EC2 instance, you have you have really rights to anywhere. And that's because of the role-based structure. So the EC2 instance has that privilege, right? So this is like a backdoor, so you never really have this privilege unless you control this. So, my point is, in an environment that isn't fully automated, and, and really, if you work for a product company that has a single product, then you can automate pretty much everything. But when you work for a complex organization that has multiple products, you can't automate everything the same way. So it's just complicated. So you have admin users, and you have power users, and you have a lot of them. But when you have a lot of them, you're, you're essentially playing a game of Django. You really are when you give that level of uh, access. So a couple ways to mitigate that is, first of all, you don't have to give everybody, even if they should have admin privileges, you don't have to give it to them all of the time. You can you can give them almost like the capability to pseudo into admin access, right? Or you can give them time-based uh, access for admin. But outside of that, I just want to point out that limited access is kind of like isolating. Imagine you tag your, your instances and your auto-scaling groups with something like allow, allow PI dash or some, something like that. You guys can remember what it is. Um, that isolates your access to a group, uh, uh, an application stack, right? Just using tags. So you can do that. But you don't really want to do that. You do that until you have things fully automated. But what's even better than this and uh, what's the least privilege is moving towards uh, something that's indirect. So you learn what people want to be doing. 
and you give them a, mex a, a, a mechanism for remote execution for that thing, right? So if they need to do RDS snapshots or if they want to do you know, executions of cloud formation, then you give them access through something like Jenkins or Lambda, and they can execute it that way. And the beauty of that is it, introduce, it introdu introduces uh, an execution model. And so that ties in kind of into the second talk, right, with like workflows. And you know, th what this enables you to do is it enables you to get everything right in an automated way. So you can you can make sure that the the parameters are validated. You can make sure that you know you've got constraints in the right place, and you can run all kinds of governance scripts before you execute what is being requested. You, and you can enforce conditions, right? So I don't want to get into the details of conditions, but um, since it's a hiking theme, it's essentially like, do we go or do we not go? Is it too windy? Is it too cold? Um, and this I thought was funny, just to just to end up here. Um, I can't tell. So essentially, you want to give you want to give your people the flexibility to do whatever they're going to do because they want to do what they want to do anyway, and they're going to do it. But you want to reduce kind of. Um, the impact that they'll have. So this I thought was pretty crazy. I couldn't tell, my eyes aren't good enough to tell if that's somebody's helmet or <laughs> if that's blood on the rock. I don't know who you guys know. <laughs> right, but I thought this was also interesting. You just have to let people do what they want to do. Right, and just, but you don't want to listen to the rock. What's that? <laughs> let them fall off the rock. Let them fall. <laughs> they don't have to take you down with them. Um, so really what the takeaways were, you know, tax for isolation, which a lot of you who use AWS may know that you can do, but a lot of people don't consider that for limited access, right? The execution model for balancing flexibility and governance um, is important. And the, the granting of least privilege, like I mentioned before, is not done as well as we can do that. Don't forget, those roles are backdoor into all of AWS if you're not controlling that. And the best way to control that, in, in my opinion, is to actually have a different group manage the uh, the deny rights, so you can so a developer is going to give themselves access to everything because they don't want to troubleshoot and it's time consuming to troubleshoot what they actually need. So what you need to do is have a security module that's an add-on policy that's all explicit denials, right? And then you can work with security to get through like this is why you need access to such, such and such. Right? So that is pretty much what I wanted to discuss, but I wanted to know from all of you sort of like how you're handling this scenario, if you guys are doing anything that's working. And since we're on the topic of least privilege, I also wanted to know, you know, if you use things like QuickBooks or, or Mint, you know, and you're allowing integrations into your bank, why aren't banks using read-only user access, you know, or like read-only roles? Some have that. Which ones? Very few. Okay. Can you name uh, I don't know. I, think I don't know about the second one, but the, the first question is: it's not give you developers console access at all. There's no reason why they need console. Well, access. yeah, that's the other argument. But in a, in a fast-paced environment that's not like fully workload, and when you're we're talking about onboarding departments constantly. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't don't go into crazy Se room. Separate accounts for developers. Yeah. Don't don't go into crazy room. Don't don't do things that are expedient because they'll bite your ass later. Yeah, the, the absolute can. Yeah, just don't give developers console access to AWS. I mean, that's that, that, that's that's sort of how business works, though. You're always not you're my never business. Gonna do not businesses I'm in doesn't work that way. Hey, right. this is a DevOps. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there's there's a dev for it. Then. Right, yeah. that would be <laughs> right. Would be kind of counter to DevOps. No, you give console? you give developers the tools they need to do their jobs. You don't give them console access to AWS. There is no reason for a developer to have console access to AWS. Unless they sign your paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you need to quit. <laughs> yeah, I knew that would come up, right? But I mean, in a development environment, they, they may want access, right? They may um, want it, but you don't give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's certainly what you want to achieve. But it's not always possible when you're moving. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.